Hey everyone, welcome back to Monster Craze Memoirs. Just a friendly disclaimer that, as always, this podcast features snippets of audio from the movies we discuss, uh, but in this case a lot of that audio may be found by some listeners to be incredibly problematic and potentially harmful. The film we are discussing in this episode is a Japanese film, but just for efficiency's sake we will be pulling a lot of audio from the English language dub of the film. The drawback of that is that this dub, made in the late 50s, is predictably racist, with the either mostly or entirely white voice cast affecting rather terrible Asian accents. And you can put Asian accents in quotes. It's not so much that we think it's terrible enough that it gets in the way of appreciating the film, but considering that this episode will get into some significant ethical and historical subjects that are specific to the films being a unique product of Japanese popular culture, we wanted to both acknowledge that, as far as the dub, the racist caricature is there, it's inexcusable, we would totally understand if some of our listeners just didn't want to hear that sort of thing. Still listening? Alright, then it's on with the show. This liquid creature... It's dangerous beyond belief. It could destroy us all. A liquid creature produced from an H-bomb explosion. Couldn't it be called H-Man? Molecular man terrifies the world. <coughs> Powerful. <laughs> I'll try that again. Molecular man terrifies the world. Powerful and terrifying as the blast that created it. Welcome back, guys and ghouls, to Monster Craze Memoirs, a generational podcast about B movies. I am your host, Ian Garcia, and with me, as always, is my father, Rocco. How you doing? So I guess the very first thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about just to open this episode is is to really, uh, it's already come up in the films we watched and it's going to come up a lot more because of the period in which these films are made that, you know, obviously uh, nuclear energy, proliferation of nuclear weapons, basically the atom is on the mind in terms of a lot of these films. You know, it creates monsters, it invites our own devastation, but it's also potentially the only solution that's offered in these films against uh, certain threats. And I guess I guess I really just wanted to uh, start just by casually interviewing you about, like, your memories of growing up in the 50s. You know, the extent of your awareness of the bomb or nuclear proliferation as this fact of life. Well, first of all, talk about these films. Many of these films have nuclear in the equation, whether it's due to nuclear fallout or nuclear from some astral material. Like in Kaltiki. Right. But anyway, to put it in perspective... Certainly, a lot of the movies that we'll be seeing to be movies are based upon the fact that we've polluted the world with nuclear energy and that this fallout will give rise to creatures or will give rise to problems for man. Specifically America. It, it, like, obviously, we'll be viewing a lot of foreign yes. films, but since our context is American, a lot of these films, you know, it, it's really rather interesting that, you know, America as a nation is probably the most singularly responsible for the proliferation of nuclear weapons, but it's also where you see, you know, the most fixation upon the nuclear weapons as, like, sort of, you know, opening the gates, if you will. Like, it, like it's this Pandora's box. You know, it's this thing that gives America its, like, power and center on the world stage but it's also the thing that could just obliterate it overnight right and, and many of the like, even eisenhower talked about it that these kinds of devastating kinds of armamentarium for war that they they have devastating consequences needless to say that there is a considerable amount of nuclear proliferation but we pretty much have put a lid on it so going back to what you're saying um i mean i mean by we put a lid on is the fact that after a while, you get so numb to the fact that everybody has nuclear weapons, and so to a point where who's going to pull the trigger? No one's going to want self-destruction, and no one's going to get out of here safely. So 
a lot of things are just um, crazy. It's just a crazy thing that. But let's go back to when I was smaller. That wasn't the case. Yeah. Back to when I was smaller, like when I was five or six years old, the kind of thing that was proposed is that we would not, we would not have the first strike, and therefore the enemy would figure a way to protect themselves against nuclear fallout. My memory is first of all of Sputnik 1957 being held by my father to watch Sputnik. That was the first kind of um, of alarm. At least the United States saw it was alarmed that it was the first satellite that lasted for about 22 days in space, but nevertheless... It, yeah, it was the first unmanned satellite, unmanned satellite successfully put into orbit around the world, and it was the Soviet Union, Soviet which Union. launched it right. in the late 50s, which beat the United States to the punch in terms of being the global superpower that breaks the bounds of the sky and achieves like... Cosmic dominance, or cosmic if you will... travel. As well, yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Basically, the United States was fearful that if they if they do get dominant, there's like a space race. There's a space race then to, that 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 occurs. Nevertheless, what we, what what were the consequences of that? Well, one is as you probably know is duck and cover. People are all familiar with duck and cover. Well, but be, at before getting into duck and cover, I guess we should like t t tie up the loose thread, which is that like you know it doesn't seem like there's a huge relationship between space travel and nuclear proliferation but what you're bringing up no, here no, no. what you're bringing up here is that contemporary to the time there was definitely a popular understanding that there's a relationship between the drive to get into space and this other geopolitical conflict of preparing ourselves for potential attack right Right. Yeah. That was the major fear was the that the Soviets would somehow use space as a launching point for satellites or, or missiles to attack the United States. Just to give you an idea, if anybody doesn't know, we had, besides the fact we had safety drills in school, which is called duck and cover, where you go under the desk if you hear the air raids go off, or many of our schools already had the universal triangles of, of radiation triangles where you go under shelters from bombs and things like that very similar to what work. were these shelters like nothing like, they often are just the basements of, of institutes brick <laughs> brick line basement like the basement of the school it's almost like a twister drill all right or an earthquake yeah. drill you're gonna yeah. hide in the doorway you're gonna hide in the right. corner you're, right. you're basically just gonna get on the floor hold your hand over your head and pray <laughs> right so that you, whether or not you, you survive is another issue the other thing was that we there was a big proliferation of what we call nuclear fallout shelters and these were like privately constructed pri like, private, and contracted like fallout right shelters. And some of these were metal line structures that were freestanding mm. and they're meant i guess to be sunk in the ground with a particular um projectile vent which would then go to the outside and many of us were told to stock water and various food items somewhere uh of course, canned food items, obviously, to prepare for this kind of thing. And so that was always, the, I have to say, there wasn't a lot of anxiety about it, but it was something that... Because well, you were just a kid. You were born in 1951, right. and, right. you know, the, the movie you alluded to, Duck and Cover, that was actually produced in 1952. So if you're growing right. up and going to school, even in the first... Like, when do you think was the first time you saw a, like, a nuclear preparedness film? It the doesn't... cartoon was shown in school. Yeah, but like what? Like what grade do you? I would well, like I said, uh, I think um, I think through the fourth grade, uh, I remember seeing these films. So these would be like periodic drills. Same thing with like a fire drill or something once well, or tw a year. But... Yes. Yeah, I would say once a year they would have these particular things, and then where would you go? Walking uniformly out of the room into a safe shelter, wherever it would be, downstairs and things like that. Did you have, like, a sirens? Did you have, no, like... No, nothing a... like that. Usually the nuns would do their clickers, and so you knew it was time for a drill. Well, you see, like, that's the big thing that's missing, because in all of these nuclear preparedness films, they're presuming that you live in a high-density urban population center where you may have bomb or air raid sirens, but... In a lot of small towns, the number one thing that is, like, actually going to give you, like, the warning to hide before the you see the flash and then feel the blast. Right. You know, the, you, you just don't have that thing. So no. you guys are kind of just... Well, it, it, no one talked about the futility of what we were talking about. It was just something that... And we didn't, as children, we didn't understand the futility, nor the fact that the danger was minimal. That there's minimal danger, someone's going to launch it. Nevertheless... It was one of those things that engendered concern and anxiety to some level, at least in adults. But I don't know if it was so much that it was an anxiety, whether it was just chatter. 
that you yeah. just talked about it to your family, you talked about it with neighbors, and then and we're... all of it's subsumed into a much larger context where it's like this is you know really the nuclear the anxiety over nuclear proliferation itself, or like you know the space race is is kind of a a mask of the mu much broader cultural and political conflict between the notion of America representing like capitalism and free enterprise and the Soviet Union representing authoritarianism and collective control and this thing that's you know potentially going to just like you know take over the world and right. take away there's individual a lot of fear liberties. about that but a lot of it, it's hard to tell whether it's propaganda based on the government to keep people in line keep the story out that we have to get we have to advance ourselves in nuclear and nuclear energy and and perfecting nuclear bombs etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, mutually assured destruction mutually we assured. need this thing so that if we're attacked they we need to have enough of these so that there will well, be never a possibility where someone's stupid enough to attack right, us. Right, or the movie fail safe. Right, there's an example where right. you know, or you go back to Stanley Kubrick's, uh, you know, Doctor Strange law, or the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like you know, suddenly like mutually assured destruction That's doesn't. That's more recent doesn't, though. Yeah, right? it doesn't sound like you know. It doesn't right. sound like a per particularly uh, successful tactic. Yeah. So duck and cover, which we already referred to, it's a uh, 1952 film that was educational film that was funded by the U.S. Federal Civil Defense Administration. It combines animation and live action dr dramatized scenarios to teach young people basically what to do when they find that they are in close proximity of a nuclear attack. And the reason I emphasize close proximity is that it goes back to what my dad already alluded to about the inherent futility of these. It, even if you've never seen Duck and Cover, and I highly encourage everyone who's listening to if you haven't watched Duck and Cover, go watch Duck and Cover. You can find it anywhere on YouTube. It's in the public domain. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. And cover. The thing about it is, is that more people have heard or seen parodies of Duck and Cover than they have really watched or experienced Duck and Cover itself. And I, I'm thinking particularly of the episode of South Park where the volcano near South Park is about to erupt and they're shown a Duck and Cover film because, you know, where the joke is like, yeah, the, you're not going to be able to just duck under a blanket and then the lava is just going to flow right over you. <clears throat> so what these parodies do is that they emphasize the futility, but I think what they don't really capture is the extent to which that what's really disturbing about these movies is not the fact that they are actually about surviving in nuclear attack. They're about civilians engaging in broad forms of social and cultural preparedness in the case that they are close enough to an attack to be a victim of it, i.e. in the danger zone, but presumably are not the actual ones who are close enough to the blast and the heat to be obliterated. So when you're watching Duck and Cover, it's important to remember that this is a film that is already making the presupposition that you are not actually that significantly close to the attack. That taking shelter, that even something like hiding under a desk or around a corner away from the flash of light, it is in a certain respect going to be just some common sense safety measures that you can take. But of course, completely left out of the scenario is the survival after, or the extent of fallout, or how climate and weather affects where the fallout goes, and the distribution of radioactive materials, and also just the fact that, you know, the idea of you being in one part of the country where you're close enough to witness a nuclear attack, and then, you know, whoever is going to be the direct victim of that nuclear attack is just gone. And obviously these nuclear preparedness films, they don't really even acknowledge this. Uh, there's another nuclear preparedness film, another um, U.S. Federal Civil Defense Administration funded movie called The House in the Middle. And rather than being primarily geared towards children, this is one that's uh, geared towards adult homeowners. Much like Duck and Cover, it presumes that the people who are watching this movie are going to be in a position where they are close enough to the bomb to be susceptible to the blast into the heat, 
but far enough away that they can take certain measures. And basically the whole purpose of the film is to encourage better housekeeping and to encourage better, you know, civil community management, like picking up trash, not leaving stray paper around, keeping a fresh reflective coat of paint on your house so that it will reflect more of the heat flash than absorb it and potentially burn down. You know, the emphasis is all on preserving private property and preserving the home. And they even use test footage from the Nevada Proving Grounds, where the vast majority of uh, thermonuclear weapons in the United States were tested. You know, in this footage, they do have experiments where they show, like, here, we built one house here, we built another house here, we built another house here. This house is in a certain state of disrepair. How will these things affect it? In the house on the right, all the earmarks of untidy housekeeping. Newspapers and magazines lying about and cluttered tables. Now the house on the left, identical to the other, but spick and span. Two homes, one a fire trap, even under ordinary conditions. The other cleaned up and fresh with better, safer housekeeping. Both ready for the test bomb. The light flash and the heat wave, then the blast tears away part of each roof. The cluttered room of the house on the right bursts into flame. In a few moments, the interior is completely ablaze. The fire that started inside spreads rapidly to the house itself, although the house on the left still shows no exterior flames. Now the house on the right burns as fiercely as if it had been deliberately fired with kindling. The lack of fire-safe housekeeping has doomed this house to destruction. In the other house, with its better, safer housekeeping, one small fire was readily extinguished afterward. Damage? Yes. But the house still stands. So I think that's interesting because it gives you also an eye into the testing of these weapons and the mentality of testing them, where, the, you know, that footage wasn't shot exclusively for a civil defense film. That footage was already being collected as part of the research for these thermonuclear weapons. This, these are things that are testing what the effects will be on our civilian population and how we can adjust to the reality of living in a world Mm -hmm. where nuclear sure. attacks could be a common occurrence, you know, just as much as they are about testing the tactical capabilities of the weapon itself. Right. They had, as you know, they had cameras inserted within these. And some of these were used in the movies. For example, a brain from Planet Eros. Yeah. A lot of this stock footage would end up being reused used, used in these, uh, the right. movies we're talking right. about. Right, exactly. It's a great way to not have to pay too much for a uh, right. complex optical effect. Right. It's weird talking about all these things now, and I'm incredibly interested in it just because there's such a, you know, it's not like we don't have our own, um, you know, in my contemporary moment, like, it's sort of like what you said before, where now the anxieties of the Cold War and the Atom Age, they're kind of viewed, like we talked about with Duck and Cover, through this perspective of, like, their kitschiness. Like how it's almost quaint that people, you know, no matter how real and tangible it was at the time, that these people were afraid that this is going to be the thing that completely destroys American life or all life on the earth is like nuclear holocaust, whereas right now the contemporary anxiety is all informed by climate change, which is this thing that unlike nuclear weapons, there is no mutually assured destruction hypothesis of how it's not going to happen. No, but it unlike, just is unlike, going nuclear, to happen. unlike nuclear energy, which is a which is an immediate, except if you're outside danger zone with fallout, but never, even then it's more immediate. Here it's more like the old frog in the hot water scenario when we talk about global warming, and therefore it's more insidious because people are more immune uh, to the to the drastic changes that are undergoing because of because of global warming. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, sure, yeah, but it's just... Do you think that, like, you know, when you think of your own childhood during this time, do you associate it with a kind of, like, do you sometimes sometimes think about it and think, like, man, that was ridiculous? I no. Yeah. No, you follow, pretty much you follow instructions. You, one doesn't, doesn't think that government has any venal uh, enterprise associated with it, and so, and, and many adults probably don't think so either, and that's probably, for the, for the bulk of civil servants, they aren't. They aren't venal individuals. So it never really occurred to us that it would be something that would be a joke. So, but it wasn't, it was never projected that it was something that was imminent. Right. So 
it's just a matter of preparedness, preparedness for anything. Um, whether you're, you know, whether you're rationing for food, rationing for rubber during World War II, whatever. These are all kinds of preparedness. Here it's a little different because you're worried about the fact that you may be obliterated by an atomic blast. Right. <laughs> Slightly different. Yeah, Not we we do different. have duck and cover drills. We do have duck and cover drills still, but now they're for mass shooting events. Exactly. You know. Exactly. That's uh, how it's seen. You know. So as far as like you know the kitschiness of Adam Age anxieties from a present context, at least from someone who's looking back on it but didn't directly experience it. It also seems like a, the idea of there being this, like you're saying, the idea of there being this present anxiety is kind of overplayed. Like, y y the way you've described it, it seems that it was far more a function of the concerns of adults of how to raise children and how to, <clears throat> like, you know, systemically make them aware of the uh, geopolitical context in which they're living in a way that is, you know, direct and, you know... Mm -hmm. uh, Right. gradual rather than having to have an entire generation of kids who grow up and suddenly realize oh my god you've been building what <laughs> you know but uh, but i also think that like even a sense of the adult anxiety is kind of overplayed like you know e like the nevada proving grounds you know th you know these are places for testing where they were very close to a lot of other small towns in nevada including las vegas and like you know being able to witness from a a quote safe distance a mushroom cloud even became a tourist attraction for a, for downtown Las Vegas and a lot of um, other surrounding small towns it it's weird how like even in this nascent early stage of nuclear proliferation the idea of testing this you know this totally catastrophic weapon it's not really seen as an imminent danger because it it is the fear is the fear is always of it coming from the outside it's never that all the bombs we're building on the interior are the threat. Those even, there's even a sort of weird, like, national pride or entertaining spectacle associated with well, them. Well, someone, someone cashed in on it, clearly. Yeah. People that made the actual bomb shelters or these uh, nuclear fallout shelters, some people did buy them. As far as I know, I don't remember anybody really bought them that I knew. But certainly there are there there and there's a price tag on the freaking machine or the this actual thing. Basically, it looks like a giant oil tank. And you saw this at the you said you mentioned you saw it at the Chicago World's no, Fair. No, no, that's Chicago because it, it was or the it was, um... it was New York World's Fair in 1964. Mm. Uh, you know, with the same globe that was later uh, destroyed by the saucer in um, in Men in Black. Um, <laughs> of course, we all know that. <laughs> so so, uh, but basically, there was one there. There's also one locally at our. Trenton Fairgrounds, but we used to have a Trenton Fair uh, out in the fairgrounds, and they had one demonstrated there. I remember walking past one of those, and it had a price tag. I think it was like eighteen hundred dollars, which was a lot of money back in those days. Yeah. So that's such a, but it's even such a bizarre concept. Like you're going to the fairground to see well, here's your nuclear survivor yeah, bunker. That's exactly what this it was. is. Where you stock plenty of room for canned right. non-perishables. Step right up. Right. This right is here, where you yeah. pack all your dehydrated yeah. food. You had, a, you had a guy with a you know, straw boater hat. And with his, his, barker, his cane and barker. You know, just a guy who the only things he knows is his jug of whiskey, his straw hat, and his and his highly advanced concrete bomb shelter. Actually, it's metal, but. It was metal. Oh, nice. Yeah, you're supposed to submerge it. So there is this ambivalence, isn't there? It's not really a straightforward anxiety. There is like this almost uneasy acclamation of the American of American pop culture to the realities of living well, in the atomic age. Well, no, there was a, there's a time when it, it was scary. I used to go to my aunt and I say, "Well, I'm afraid that the Russians are going to come across the Bering." Bearing straight into Be Alaska because you saw a map of the world as a kid. You saw the map of the world and everything looks smaller, right? right. And close together. Oh my God, they can just walk well, over from Alaska. Hey, Sarah Palin says she could see Alaska, <laughs> right? In Russia from the window. So okay, she was talking about bomb tests. But my aunt said, "What are you worried? What are you talking about Bearing Strait? What about Cuba? It's only..." And I realized Cuba's. A, you know, <laughs> I like how you went to your aunt with this terror. You're just how old were you? Like you're just this remember. terrified kid saying yeah. the Russians are going to come and get us. And her answer is, "No, nah, honey, you'll." probably be the cubans <laughs> come through cuba <laughs> she she you know she should get some royalty she thought of red dawn way before that uh before anyone thought anyway of it. so yeah there was some anxiety i'm not saying that we, did, we didn't have anxiety but there was also clearly like again just like 
straightforward like capitalization and like almost carnival barker like exploitation sure of it. absolutely like those bomb shelter guys like most of them had to know that this was like this is the greatest grift people well, are... i don't know if that's true or not i mean the i mean if you submerge it theoretically i don't know how long can you land how can long can you stay in a sardine can I mean, you have to stock it you would i mean i don't know exactly and it's not clear whether or not the filters were right to take leave out radioactive particles. Certainly, um, when we were kids, they told us not to eat the snow because of all the testing that snow would carry the radio radioactive particles. And that's not. See, I was just told to not eat snow because there might be animal feces in it. Right, like dog pissed on it or something like that. But the right. point is, the, um, the, the of course, the, the, but the real thing is that there is radiation. For example, I think it was cesium. Cesium something, or strontium, strontium 90, strontium 90 got into our bones, so there wasn't, there wasn't strontium enough. Strontium 90 got into our bones? Yeah. Just, just from the sheer amount of uh, American national bomb testing. Exactly. Enough, enough radioactive yes. material yes. was produced that now basically everyone right. in America of a certain generation sure. has an amount of strontium um, It's not surprising there are more age people around because in fact it was strontium 90. <laughs> yeah, where it's amazing we haven't evolved into liquefied yeah, people exactly. or a new race of super mutants. Uh, but yeah, so definitely like there's, again, there is this ambivalent quality. There is the very real anxiety, but there's also the drive to capitalize upon and potentially mitigate that in anxiety. You know, the Adam age, like probably the reason we most remember it or the lens through which we most remember it, if it's not the cold war, then it's cold war movies. Like, you know, the bomb and nuclear proliferation was a huge influence on the creation of a lot of B movies. And, you know, they were not just framing it as a potential source of a threat. They were framing it as a potential source of mutation, excitement. Mutation yeah, and, yeah. yeah yep. like, so I'm thinking particularly of, you know, American films kind of began them in earnest. There was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, there was Them, and then there was Tarantula. It's almost as if these movies in some way, because all of these movies feature a creature that is either activated or reanimated or created in some way by um, radioactive materials. The Beast from 20,000 is thawed out after a new, uh, after a uh, H-bomb test. The ants of them are created in where else but Nevada, <laughs> where all the bombs are being tested. And Tarantula is about a scientist who is using radioactive isotopes to try to um, grow animals and plants and ends up creating a giant tarantula. But the conclusion of these films is always that the American military comes in and puts down the threat. Well, they... and even the Beast of 20,000 Fathoms, the problem with that thing is that not only did the military put the beast down, well, actually military and scientists, they used a nuclear weapon to speed yeah. up the nuclear reaction yeah. it's, within. It's that great joke, is that, like, you know, it's, it's exactly like what we talked about from Hell It Came, like, America, you know, I'm, I'm stealing this joke from The Simpsons and then from some other podcast called Citations Needed, but, you know, America is the cause of and solution to all of life's That's problems. Right. You know, but yes, the nuclear energy yes it is the thing that created the problem but it's also the key to solving it right. we just need to be objective right so like there's a very clear mitigation of fears there not really dealing with the anxiety but rather presenting an escapist fantastic scenario and it and part of it has to be self-critical doesn't it because like on, on a certain point there needs to be this kind of unconscious realization of americans that like you know we're, ha we're imagining all of these horrible things that are coming about as a result of the reckless thing we're doing, but we also have to introduce the contrivance where we do overcome it and then don't really need to think about it anymore. It's the pottery boring. Once you break it, you have to clean it up and fix it, right? <laughs> Uh, and obviously, you know, so the reason we've had that kind of long introduction is because I do think it is really relevant to establish the clear, you know, narrative arc of most um, United States and other Western movies that are from the Atom Age and how they portray nuclear proliferation or nuclear energy as a threat. There's a really stark difference between The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and, say, a movie that came out the very next year and was in part inspired by The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and its economic success, Godzilla. 
you know, in Godzilla, the, the solution to the radioactive monster is not more radioactivity. And the fact that the monster is done away with, but nuclear proliferation is not, means that we have a monologue at the end delivered by the sympathetic scientist Dr. Yamane, where he talks about how if nuclear proliferation continues, there will be more Godzillas. So there is this very much different framing where this understanding that the monster itself is just like a symptom of a larger thing that needs to be addressed critically. We're not going to talk about Godzilla today. We are going to be talking about The H-Man, which was a movie that was made in 1958 by Toho Film Company, the same studio that created Godzilla, directed by the same director of Godzilla, Ishiro Honda, produced by the same producer of Godzilla, Tomoyuki Tanaka, and with special effects by the same special effects artist of Godzilla, Eiji Tsuburaya. This movie, in a lot of ways, is almost a remake of Godzilla, but instead of a giant saurian monster the monster is a human monster and the monster is liquefied people in order to understand the movie i think we do need to just get into a little bit of history about what informed both godzilla directly and what then also consequently informs the h-man so the movie opens with a shot of this very dirty looking fishing vessel, presumably a fishing vessel, you know, just sort of drifting around in the night. There doesn't appear to be any crew on it. It's basically a ghost ship. Now, we don't know this yet, but it will be revealed to us later that the name of this ship is the Ryujin Maru. The relevancy of this ghost ship won't be made clear until about a half hour later into the movie when we get the flashback from a duo of fishermen who tell the story about how their tuna fishing boat came upon the Ryujin Maru and subsequently had some of their members attacked and killed by these liquefied radioactive people who are on the Ryujin Maru. The Ryujin Maru translates to Golden Dragon Number 5, and this is a clear reference to Fukuryu Maru, which is the Lucky Dragon Number 5. Obviously, Jin being gold or golden in Japanese has similar connotations to the Fuku for Lucky. But the Lucky Dragon Number 5 was a 23-man tuna fishing boat that was caught in... No, I have to say that it's a real thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, this, this, the references are to real... Events. Yeah, this is an obvious reference to a, you know, this opening of the film, which, like the opening of Godzilla, which features another uh, similarly named tuna fishing boat being attacked by Godzilla. These are both inspired by the same real event. The Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 was a 23-man tuna fishing boat that was caught in nuclear fallout from the Castle Bravo test on March 1st, 1954, in which a hydrogen bomb with a predicted 6 megaton yield was detonated by the U.S. Navy at the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands and proceeded to yield roughly two and a half times the radioactive material that was predicted. The Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 was not the only casualty of Castle Bravo, and Eastward Wind Shear delivered some fallout to the various indigenous peoples of the Marshall Islands, particularly the people of Ronglap and Utrecht. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong who were only evacuated 48 and 72 hours after initial exposure to fallout, respectively. While both atolls were declared safe for rehabilitation in 1957, the peoples themselves saw severe indigenous food loss, as well as the long-term effects of radiation exposure, such as increased frequency in leukemia and growth retardation. And, of course, traces of radioactive material also traveled as far as India, Japan, and Australia, turning the secret test into an international incident. But for our purposes, the Lucky Dragon number 5 getting caught in the Castle Bravo debacle proved to be a very historically important event. The crew had been exposed to fallout for several hours. Upon returning to the mainland on March 14th, they showed symptoms of nausea, headaches, pains in the eyes, bleeding of the gums, and burns on their skin, particularly their arms and scalps, 
and they were diagnosed with acute radiation syndrome. The Lucky Dragon wasn't the only Japanese ship exposed to radioactive materials from Castle Bravo, but it was the first known and most highly publicized, particularly because one of the crew, Chief Radioman Aikichi Kuboyama, died in the hospital of his condition on September 23rd. His last words were reportedly, please make sure that I am the last victim of the nuclear bomb. So let's talk about the, vi you know, the sort of content symmetry between this, this event and how it's kind of adapted in both Godzilla and the H-Man. Because it does seem particularly apt that both movies feature a particular concern of fishermen, because that immediately doesn't just bring up questions of people being threatened, it also brings up questions of food being contaminated, of the environment being ruined. You know, it connects to a sort of conception of the people who are the lowest on the on the ladder in terms of labor, these people who are the most prone to danger and who are the most expendable. No, you're right. Like anything, the people that are most affected are the people that are the, the laborers at those particular... They're not the... Well, they're not people of the walks of life that have businesses within the city and don't just rely on the food chain. These are the people who actually do the fishing. Often or, hand to mouth. Right. They're, they're very subsistence. Right. And uh, you see well, you see that today they're... Now, I wouldn't say necessarily that they're taken advantage of. I think it's just the, the structure of their socioeconomic structure. These are fishermen. That's their livelihood. is, and They're, they're good, they're well-trained at what they do. But nevertheless, because of the fact that these are often water blasts of uh, nuclear energy, it's not surprising that the fishing, the fishing industry is the first set of where you see changes or things that, that alert you to the fact that there's something going on here. That's very, very true in a lot of films like that. Regardless of whether you're talking about uh, Godzilla or the H-Man, usually it's the people in the outer walks of mm. outside cities, and you know, that are the ones that, are first, that first see these things, and then it, work, it works its way inward to the cities. And it also becomes this issue of like whether those people are deemed to be credible. You know, we're, sure. we're in Godzilla, of course, they don't just take at face value what these indigenous people or these fishermen are saying about this monster. They have to go out and investigate, and it, ultimately it's proven that they are, you right. know, correct, and that it's not just right. baseless superstition. So I just wanted to give that rather, um, you know, it was kind of a lengthy summary of events. I didn't really get into everything about the Castle Bravo test. But I think it was important to emphasize because we haven't surveyed a lot of films yet in this podcast, but I'm going to go ahead and make the claim that The H-Man is probably the first and will be one of the few ones where part of its content and then the themes that follow from it are described by a real historical event. Movies like From Hell It Came or The Disembodied or Kaltiki, The Immortal Monster were always moving around this issue of whether the thematic content of the film is intentional or whether it's merely coming out of the art because of like whatever like unquestioned values or assumptions or mm -hmm. or just good filmmaking. Mm -hmm. With this, we don't really have that issue, not only because the filmmakers, you know, lived and commented, have commented explicitly on their being inspired by these things, but also because the films themselves make it rather explicit that there is an ethical component to them, sure. that these are That's not, right. that they're right. not just stories about monsters, that this is a larger story about, um, about people and the human cost of something that exists in the real world and is tangible and accelerated. Accelerating, because it, in fact it was accelerating. You know, uh, at the time Toho released the H Man on June twenty fourth, nineteen fifty eight, which was four years after the release of Godzilla. In that time, it wasn't as if the United States and then the United Kingdom just stopped their nuclear weapons tests, whether it was in the Bikini Atoll or el elsewhere in the Pacific. Those things continued and they accelerated and really and really all of those same threats to the ecology and to indigenous peoples and to other and you know to anyone who is in the vicinity of these weapons tests, all of those things still remain and in fact just kept accelerating. Given that the H-Man, we can view it as kind of a remake of Godzilla, 
it's almost as if the movie itself needs to kind of expand upon Godzilla because it's dealing with a situation where the outlook was pessimistic before about what the actual possibility is of living in a world without nuclear weapons. It Four years later, it seems even less likely now. You know. Well, the problem is that, and also that when you, the, there's a more, it's more visceral. H Man is a more visceral movie because Godzilla is a large creature, which most people could write off saying, even kids would say, well, that's, that's fantastical. There's no way. Still, it doesn't mean it's not good storytelling, but right. certainly when you talk about the change of a human being into something. There's a clear metaphor there yeah, that you can relate to. Sure, especially since after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the kinds of burns and disfigurements that occurred with the radiation. And, and lasted they, through generations. Right. Like, you know. All the problems you have, there's a real... That's more insidious in terms of in terms of its um, visceral visceral impact. That the H Man, although it's I would have to say it's a less scary movie. It nevertheless, it's a mm. more uh, disturbing movie in that it, it talks about the direct effects of radiation on humans, changing them. And uh, as, as you mentioned before, these are mostly reduction changes, changes where you go from human to something protoplasmic, which is very interesting. Instead of it's like a devolution. Devolution. It's right, not. Right. It's not just like Caltiki or the Blob or right. the Quatermass experiment, where the Blob is merely assimilating organic matter. It is the human themselves is kind of by proximity to radiation is transformed into something that's horrific and subhuman and kind of tragic in a way. The H Man in question, or the Liquid People, as they're called more often in the uh, Japanese film, the Japanese version of the film, they're not not really malicious figures at all. They're not even really avaricious. They are kind of a tragic representation of someone and people who are being transformed by something that's completely out of their control. But unlike something that comes from nature, you know, there is someone who can be very directly blamed for what is making them lose control of themselves and lose their identities. Right. And also, you have to keep in mind that these, although it gets off on a tangent, maybe I mentioned this previously to you, is that this is a forerunner of The Terminator 2, in which the, mm. the, the villain is a... Is also, a, is th- a, also themes of nuclear warfare in that movie, too. Right, and there it's intelligent liquid metal that can shape itself into anything, mm. other people. So it's very interesting that not necessarily whether any of these arose organically to the writers, but I'm certain any or any writer of such films has a vast history of knowing what what was presented already. Yeah, so I think that's, I mean the, the, again, it was recent history. The sure. war had only ended for you know the 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 Lucky Dragon number five incident was only four years ago. The war had only ended nine years before that. Like, this this was all very recent stuff that was still sure. very pressing Absolutely. upon the imagination. And it's obviously categorically different from the response of the nation, which had never been the victim of a nuclear attack, but nonetheless did fantasize all these fantastic scenarios of what it might be like to be victimized. But it doesn't really come close to the direct reference point, does it? Yeah, it's really, but the other thing that's really, and I can't figure out why this is, America, which is the source of all these problems, uh, seems remarkably immune. How many times has Jap- Japan been destroyed by something related to, the, whether you're talking about Godzilla, Rodan, or and Great Britain? Yeah, why don't the Dinosaurs, monsters go to the people many, who are responsible? How many times does the Tower of London have to be knocked down or the, the bell tower get broken? <laughs> it's broken every every monster movie gets broken. And it's kind of funny because these were the places that were bombed. Isn't that interesting? So England was bombed by the Nazis and and yeah. Japan was bombed by America to, to end the war. So it's uh, it's almost like... Yeah, the, the, the threats, a, are, the threats it, are almost more cataclysmic, and I would agree with you. Right? Like, there's a decided <laughs> difference... And I I would even say, like, something like the beast from 20,000 Fathoms... The only and, time that America Gor- gets attacked is... Excuse me, I don't interrupt you. The only time America gets attacked is in our own movie, movie Failsafe, where we have, to, we have to destroy ourselves because we... Let a we, bomb go in Moscow, right? Right. It, it's like it, your, it, it's I mean, almost it's almost a kind of suicidal yeah. ideation, <laughs> where like you you know you could see like in one way the spectacle to a country like Japan might be in in a way a weird way of mitigating the lingering feelings of anxiety about feeling attacked and feeling unsafe because you know Godzilla very quickly 
you know, at the time this film was made, the Godzilla franchise wasn't even a thing. Godzilla, the last movie he was in was the second one in 1955. He wouldn't appear again on screen until 1962 in King Kong vs. Godzilla. This was not yet the period when Toho and Tomoyuki Tanaka had this idea that this that they were making a franchise driven by one monster. Like, they were... They were trying all sorts of ideas of special effects right. heavy movies, but the, but the um, but the interesting thing is that you know as far as Godzilla, once he does take up the mantle of being kind of the studio's flagship mascot, he suddenly transforms from a nuclear menace to into a superhero. Right. He becomes almost like a vision of Japan reborn after the war. That's exactly right. And, some of the... and in fact, he fights the monsters that destroy private right. property. He's the protector. Right. <laughs> but um, but like you yeah, said, but America doesn't have that. I, it seems you... it seems like the spectacle in America is almost all a kind of suicidal ideation. Well, that's suicidal. Like, oh, well, it's again, it's making America feel good about itself. That it, because if the gonna only... des- we're going to destroy New York because we made a mistake and bombed Moscow and feel yeah. safe, right? Yeah. To feel good about ourselves, we're gonna. It is it. a weird thing, isn't yeah. it? And it's the same. Like we can feel good about Even just dis- we're the source. <laughs> right. We can feel good about destroying the world because that, in and of itself, is easier to imagine than just do- doing the bigger thing and letting go of our own paranoia and our own antagonism and trying to find and you know just getting rid of the thing which shouldn't even exist in the first place. Must I talk now? You owe us an explanation. I'm studying nuclear explosion, the physical effects of H-bomb ashes on human beings, like strontium-90, castium-137, plutonium... How does all of this concern Misaki's case? So let's just jump in and discussing the film, and I do... Just breaking down everything about it, because I feel like, you know, we've already established the cultural credibility for interpreting the film, which is that it is directly inspired by a historical event that was in the recent memory of the creators. It has been talked about by the creators as being a very significant influence on the types of films they made during this period. But, you know, even right down to the difference in title, I think is interesting because this movie was it was edited dubbed and distributed by columbia pictures in the united states as the h-man now the h-man is a term that comes up in the movie but more often than not the monster of the film or monsters as it were are referred to as liquid people and the japanese title for the movie is bijoto ekitai ninjin which translates to beauty and the liquid people so just mm-hmm. even just the contrast between those two names, like I think, speaks volumes about the difference between how the Columbia Pictures one is being packaged for an American audience versus what the actual inspiration and marketing in a Japanese national cinematic context is. Because Beauty and the Liquid People, like obviously it conjures up the image of Beauty and the Beast, right? Mm-hmm. And it is, and it is true, as we'll get into, that there is an element of the film which is about a tragic relationship between beauty and a monster, but also it's emphasizing thematics rather than content. You know, beauty and the liquid people is very evocative. It has that sort of fairy tale thing, and it's directly referencing a, a character in the film. The beauty is a nightclub singer named uh, Chikako, who is played by Yumi Shirakawa. You know, so she's the beauty of the film. And the liquid people, you know, they're not a single person. They're kind of a undifferentiated mass of radioactive but still living organic matter, which has been the result of people who were exposed to nuclear fallout being melted, and then those people going on to assimilate the organic matter of other people. But as far as their absorption of it, there's an implication made in the movie by another character named Dr. Maki that it's possible that an aspect of a person, the person's psyche is preserved as they're assimilated. And so when we see the pairing of beauty and the liquid people, it's not actually a stretch to say that this is a reference to Beauty and the Beast because the opening of the film after we get past the ship and after we get past the opening credits is of Chikako's husband, Mizaki, being assimilated. And then the rest of the film, eerily enough, wherever Chikako goes, people end up being assimilated by the uh, liquid people. I agree. Yeah. Why, would, why, would, why would a liquid person 
Is it just happenstance that the liquid people happen to go in when he's, she's being challenged by the the guy? I guess it's the, one of the other... Yeah, there's a part in the movie where a gangster called Nishiyama yeah. assaults her, and then after he goes out the window, he's attacked by uh, the liquid right. people. Yeah, so there's definitely an element here. Right, or even at the end scene where she's in the... The guy that's holding her gets attacked by the... Yeah. The question is whether she would ever be attacked. That's one thing that's always... Well, she is almost attacked. She is almost attacked. In the nightclub, like, you know... But but again, it gets into this issue of, like... So, like, the H-Man as a thing is just advertising content. It's just an abstract monster which is going to be in the film... But it doesn't really impart the sense that the monster is a character in the story. And I think that is what ends up being the case with the H-Man, is that the monster isn't just this abstract force or, you know, natural threat. It is, in fact, a character, almost in a sort of classical, tragic sense, like, you know, Frankenstein's monster or something. Right. There's already something very offbeat about the movie from the beginning, which also distinguishes it from a lot of the movies we've seen, which is that, you know, all three of the previous movies we've seen, and most, you know, B-movies that I've seen in my entire life, the opening music of the film is very typical, intended to, like, suggest dread or fright. You know, it's like, bum, 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 bum. But the opening score to... The opening title music to um, The H-Man is a military march. And it's not just like a... It, you know, it's not just like a stoic march, either. It's a very kind of patriotic yes. right. and upbeat, upbeat one. Right, yes, it is. And it just contrasts so much with the image of just this ghost ship just, like, drifting alone in the water. Like, it, and it makes me wonder, like, I'm wondering if it's potentially something that was deliberately done. It's not disturbing because the music isn't no, it's scary, just, it, it seems but it, inappro- that seems inappropriate or it's mi- mi- mismatched. Yeah, you, you almost right. have to say, like, something's wrong here. Right. Like, this is... Like, right, you, get, you think you're going to be seeing some kind of military film that that launches success, you know, or we can cut to the end and do that. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. almost like a parody, in a way, of exactly what contemporary American uh, monster movies were at the time, because they did have the dreadful music, but, like, all of them are so much more about, you know, patriotic pride and military exceptionalism. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's almost the opposite here. Right. Where, like, the point is precisely that... All of that military patriotism, all of that conservativeness, you know, and force in the face of something is just a show, whereas the, the thing that's abundantly clear to you is just this this ghost ship, this unresolvable, right. horrific right. thing. I think you're right. I think the, the movie, the music does not, I don't know, does not dovetail with at all the... The composer for the movie was Masaru Sato, and there's actually a pretty diverse range of music in it because a lot of the movie does take place in a nightclub where Chicago mm-hmm. um, works and in the sort of criminal underbelly that of the Tokyo that, you know, that hangs around these places. You know, there are opportunities where some a lot of the score is jazz-inspired and, you know, a sort of exotic-flavored jazz. It's, ve- it's a very interesting, you know, contrast of motifs. But as far as, like, the sort of beginning the film with a military march, that contrast between the sound and the image, it is a good introduction to what we're going to be seeing narratively. Because, again, to stress once again, you are not going to see this ghost ship or even find out its name, or even find out what its purpose in the narrative is, what its function is, until a half hour later when you get into the Fisherman's flashback. What we begin the film with is, you know, this first half hour is really devoted largely to a story of police versus criminals. It's almost like a kind of noir film. The opening is sort of appropriate because there's this conflict between this overture of pride and of, you know, straightforwardness and getting things done and, you know, being strong and being mighty and fighting off, you know, fighting for righteousness, whereas the underlying reality is that this is all just a misdirection from the, uh, from the real looming I don't problem. think so. Maybe part of it was the fact that psychologically Japanese audiences were still disturbed with what occurred 
years previous with Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and perhaps the, the, the music at the beginning was an antidote. You mean, to, so you're thinking that I maybe think, like the patriotic music is kind of a function, it's not, it's not subversive, it's, it's an honest attempt to like sort of inspire a certain kind of pride. I think it's, pride. it's, it's a pride relief from a, well, it could be a very disturbing film for many who are still suffering the effects of radiation. Remember, this is only in the 50s yeah. where it comes out. What, 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 you don't know what the audience's take is going to be. So I think possibly, maybe, and although it's not clear, that maybe what it was is a, is a way to give people hope. Maybe that's a, a, a an emotional kind of lift, knowing that whatever is going to see, they're going to see. They're eventually, they're, whatever the creature is going to be vanquished at the end. I don't know. I don't that know, maybe we're going to come out on the other yeah, end of yeah, this sort yeah, of dark tunnel. Yeah. After we get out of the ship, we're in the streets of Tokyo. It's a rainy night. There's a guy sitting in a car. We don't know his name. He, you know, he looks like a fairly typical gangster type. One of his cohorts comes running up to his car with a bag we don't know what's in it he's about to put the bag in the trunk when suddenly he's attacked by something off scene which seems to be coming up from the ground he fires his gun and then the driver you know speeds off away and then when the police arrive on the scene they don't find his body and instead just his belongings and empty clothes and then we get a sort of a panning shot from the clothes to the gutter of the alley, sort of, you know, telegraphing to the audience what has, you know, actually happened to right. this person. Now you have the whole plot. <laughs> yeah, now you have the whole plot. It's living in a sewer, yeah. and it's, <laughs> it's liquefied it's, it's liquid people. That's what's going on. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it, it's very, you know, it's like the movie isn't hiding its cards there. So it is interesting that, you know, then it is true that, like, for the next half hour, we're primarily following a character called um, Inspector Tomonaga, who is played by uh, Akihiko Hirata, who a lot of you will recognize because he appear he was a character actor who appeared in a lot of these films and he actually played dr sarazawa in godzilla right. he's the scientist who creates the weapon that destroys right. godzilla but also takes his life right. in the process so he's in this movie as Ex inspector tomonaga these these characters are just so conservative and straightforward as just these no-nonsense policemen that it's almost kind of straining, you know, it's like th they don't seem to really bat an eye at the mysteriousness of, like, you know, just a guy... Ru what they believe has happened is that the guy just ran away naked in the night for some reason. Like, they don't really seem to to dwell upon it. They just immediately jump into... Which is kind of stupid, because the clothes are interlocked. Now, if you're going to take off your clothes and run, it's going to be a scattering of clothing, sort of like when the Invisible Man takes off his clothes... He drops a shoe, he drops the shirt, and he's running, right? Yeah, like there's clearly something amiss here. Yes. So what's really bizarre about it is that, like, Tomonaga, he treats this... Because what we find out is that the, that the uh, bag was full of drugs. It was full of about 7 to 8 million yen worth. We don't get told what the drug is. Like, I'm assuming it's like cocaine or heroin or opium or something. Right. They find out that the drugs were stolen from uh, the locker at a train station from a guy whose alias is Mr. Gold. We're told that he's foreign, but we're not told what foreign means. He's a Japanese actor, but he's possibly playing someone who's Chinese or Korean, but, like, it's never really made specific. We just know he's just a foreigner. And he's not really a, f a function of the plot. He appears in one scene to be interrogated. But did they arrest him? I can't... They do arrest him, and they because it is his locker. He right. is the one who had the locker that had the bag full of drugs in it, so they do arrest him and question him but he's really only there in the narrative to confirm the identity of Mizaki, right. Mizaki right. and that's the name of the guy who was you know killed liquefied. who was liquefied in the opening right. of the film he, his name is Mizaki and he's a known gangster a known drug dealer from there the police proceed th with the idea that this is strictly about them catching a criminal rather than investigating a mysterious disappearance like and I think it does go back to what you said that like it it seems so, when you really break it down, it seems so obvious that, like, something should go off in your brain, that, like, there's something amiss here that might trump that there was technically a crime committed. They view it as Mizaki having fled the scene of the crime without his clothes, 
rather than that Mizaki has disappeared and that that is the actual problem. And that, you know, that turns out to be a fairly, you know, consistent, um, dramatic tension throughout the film. The police are convinced that what they are trying to do is catch drug dealers and drug runner and, um, gun runners when what is actually happening is that they are completely overlooking this um th this series of related incidents in which people are being killed by liquid people you know so the next thing they do is they discuss they confirm Mizaki's identity from his clothes and also because Mr. Gold recognizes him in a book like. of their uh, headshots of known gang affiliates and criminals. They go to his apartment where they find his wife, uh, Chicago, in bed. And this is a really interesting scene because it just, it it does show the kind of hard brutality of the police. It's like, not they don't do anything particularly violent but there are all sorts of little things that are shown in the scene that present that make it hard for us to identify with the police as heroes like for one they go up to the door they're about to knock on the door but then the woman across the hall is coming out of her apartment and she sees one of the police officers with his guns drawn. There's three of them surrounding a door. And she goes to scream, and the one with the gun grabs her and puts his hand over her mouth, and then they show her the badge. And it's just like, it's this very, you know, it's like, it's not a very righteous-looking moment on the, pol on the behalf of the police. And then later on, when Chicago is getting changed to go with them for questioning one of them attempts to peek through the um right the doorway to see her while she's changing and they sort of have a knowing glance with each other like oh, i missed an opportunity there they're not portrayed as particularly heroic people from the outset before we realize just how off base their investigation is gonna right. keep going that's right right, right. And, you know, I guess it goes back to the it's the weird thing where it's like, you know, for a large part of the movie, it functions as a noir film, but it's a noir film where the mystery plot that the police are chasing isn't going to go anywhere. So they bring in Chicago for questioning, you know, she's not, you know, she's a mole, but she's not a femme fatale, that she's not like supposed to be right. like this manipulative person. She's portrayed as basically being very genuine she doesn't know that Miyazaki, that Mizaki has gone missing. She doesn't really have any awareness of what's going on in his life. And sort of to establish, like, the higher level of filmmaking that's going on, there's a shot at her apartment where one of the... As the um, investigators break in, basically, they look around the place. It seems completely empty. And then there's just one point where one of them looks at a picture on a mantelpiece... And then we get a close-up of the picture, and it's Chikako and Mizaki basically on a hill, looking up at the sky under a tree. Like, it's a beautiful day, you know, they're very happy. You know, and it's a completely different depiction of Mizaki than the one that we get only from the police. And far from it being just like an artifice, I think this does speak to what the film is doing very subtly in order to problematize from the outset, our association of the cops with justice. Because the cops have this, already have this very sort of narrow way of viewing their jobs and what they're doing, versus the reality which appears to be more nuanced. And I think it's interesting that they included that close-up shot, because it's not really not something that informs the movement of the narrative. But it does help to establish, you know, right. the complexity of the relationships at work right. in the story. And I don't really think that from the three previous films we've seen, I don't really think we've ever seen one that was that that was that meticulous. Because it's not, and it, and it's not like from Hell It Came where everything is established through exposition. A lot of this stuff, and you were talking about that too, where it's like it, it's almost a, a shame that so much of the plot is this crime caper stuff that goes nowhere. Because of a lot of the, a lot of the time, you can't even really understand what's going on. Well, it's not confusion. It just seems to me that well, I mean, the film takes what appears to be normal life of 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 cops and and robbers, if you will. Let's do yeah. cops and robbers, and uh, or and then superimposed on that, you have this evil element that's now the the liquefied people, and now it becomes a contrast between 
the linear thinking of the of the police force in terms of solving what they think is a crime and then negating or if you will slow to assimilate the view of a, a biochemist as we mm. was a, I forget the guy's name As uh, yeah professor assist, assistant professor Asada uh, right. he's played by a guy named Kenji Sahara again another one of these actors who appeared in a lot of these in a lot of these movies I think he was a contract Oho star like a lot of like a lot of them were so let's get into the introduction of Asada, because it's really only when he enters the picture that it stops being about the filmmakers telegraphing very subtly things that sort of undermine a our perception of the police as exclusively heroic and working towards something productive versus the exposit the expounding on what the actual crisis of the movie is, which is absolutely not uh, the crime. So. Chicago is set free after she's interrogated and they get nothing because the and the police put a tail on both her apartment and they send people to follow her to the nightclub. There's this nightclub scene in the movie, one of two, and it's very interesting to me at least like how much of the threat of criminality in the film ends up being associated with this sense of foreignness. We already got a little of that with Mr. Gold, who is just offhandedly mentioned to be a foreigner, and it's not really dwelled upon that. Then as we get into the club, where again, there's a lot of jazz music, a lot of the people in the club have like hairstyles and, you know, facial hair, and, you know, they have gangster looks to them that seem to be fairly clearly inspired by, by Western icons. And not only is the music they're playing jazz, but Chicago, she sings in English. When the light's low And the muted violins Are playing soft and slow what did you think about that? That you're watching this Japanese movie and it has two English have, language musical numbers. I have no idea what the, what they were going for. Um, the songs aren't very good. Let's just say they're, they're all. She, or the singing is all right. Right. She, even though she's singing, obviously she probably doesn't have a good singing voice because she. No, dumb. it's actually not uh, the right. actress's uh, singing but voice. But she did yeah. it. But the woman. The Chicago is singing in English, though, even though yeah. she, her voice is not hers. Fluently. It's right. not like, you know, it's right. like... It, and so, like, I should say... Yeah, so like you mentioned, uh, the singing voice is not provided by uh, Yumi Shirakawa. Uh, the singing voice is a woman named Martha Miyake, or Martha Miyake. I think it was just a general ploy for... Since you, did you say this is done by... who? Was this... Um, United Ours? No. No, 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 no. This was distributed by Columbia. Columbia. So maybe for an for an American audience, there might have... just have been a functional reason to include yes. like this then, a lot of this American and then Japanese gangster stuff. for the Japanese who were watching the film as we were. No, talking. actually, the singing was not dubbed. The singing wasn't dubbed in the Japanese version. No. So this is the thing: is that like no, but she's singing in English though? Yeah, I know. So, but the woman who's dubbing her singing voice, Martha Miyake, is yeah. a Japanese pop artist who is sings primarily English language pop and jazz music. I understand. I understand, but that, but, but I would imagine that the Japanese are watching this. They may not understand English, so they probably did a italicized words of what she's singing right i don't if, think if, they did like and this is the japanese audience well this is the thing is that like you know it's like and from what i understand popular music in japan which is not only done in a americanized or westernized style but also uses english language lyrics rather than japanese language ones were actually fairly popular. This is an element of the movie where, just like the Lucky Dragon number five, it's not necessary. Like part of it might just be that it, you know, it makes the film more marketable to a international audience. But another aspect of it is is that it's actually responding to a real aspect of Japanese popular culture at the time. And I think, I think the association of that foreignness with criminality, it takes on a very distinct character in this movie. It's, you know, like American noir and crime films, a lot of times they're associated with like Italian and Irish Americans, you know, being the big heavies or the bad guys or the fall guys. And in the case of the Japanese, we see an analogous situation, but where now the 
it's almost as if the threat itself is of like a, mm. you know, of a westernizing decadence or a westernizing value system, which is like potential, you know, because even the Japanese actors in the film who are playing this these gangsters, they do look like they are American gangsters. They are adopting these styles, and I think one of the actors in the scene, he's the uh, he's a nightclub waiter, but he's also a thug for the gangsters. His name is Shimazaki, and he's played by an actor called Nadao Carino. But he himself, the actor, seems like it seems rather obvious. I don't know for a fact, but he seems like he's biracial. So I think it's interesting, like, how the casting and production design, it does sort of, to me at least, it sort of adds another element of the sense of, like, opposition between the police as sort of representatives of conventional, more conservative moral authority. Oh, I just think it's just the character. I don't think there is a deliberate... I just think it's just the way it is when they, think when they cast it. I don't know. Yeah. It could, that, that it could be. be, it could be, yeah. it could, but regardless of the way, way the art form is interpreted as it comes out, it could be a contrast like you're saying. So anyway, right. we, we got on this tangent by talking about how Asada is introduced. So Asada is at the club, and at first we, th as just like Chikako assumes and then the police assume, we assume that he's related to Mizaki in some way, because he slips her a note, I need to talk to you about Mizaki. He goes to her dressing room, she immediately gives him money because she assumes that he's just like another gangster or another sort of courier who's going to get this money to him so he can like flee the country or something. But then the police break in and arrest him and they bring him in and then it turns out that Tomonaga knows um, Asada personally or he at least recognizes him in some aspect. And we discover that Asada is a, a scientist at, the, at a university. He's an assistant professor of biochemistry and he is conducting his own independent investigation of Mizaki's disappearance because he has a hypothesis. And uh, what is his hypothesis, Father? Yeah, I think he straightforward just tells him, doesn't he? That they're liquefied? Yeah, like yeah. what if it... Yeah, he puts it in questioning terms, like what if it was possible? And I think, you know, again, to completely put to bed the idea of whether a lot of this stuff was deliberately done... You know, Asada, when he's talking about what he would ask Mizaki or Chikako, is that he's particularly interested in knowing if they have been, if Mizaki has ever been to Bikini Atoll or, or Christmas Island, which is a um, westernized name for the island of Kiramati. It's, an, it's a, another South Pacific island which was um, subject to extensive uh, H-bomb tests by the United Kingdom, contemporaneous to the making of the uh, film, in mm. fact. So it, was not it wasn't just a, not just a reference to the immediate past, it was a reference to the present. This was a, these were experiments that were going on. He, he gives his speculation, the police let him go, but from the moment of his introduction, Asada basically becomes a thorn in the side of the investigation because he will not let up on his hypothesis, no matter how um, fantastic and irrational Tomonaga thinks it is. Right. But I think there's this, you know, it's not simply an, an it's not simply a function of Asada's theory being outlandish. Like what you're saying that radioactive fallout melted people and turned them into like a living protoplasm that's going to absorb other people. It's also just their functional way of looking at things. You know, Tomonaga for the next half hour of the movie will continue to treat the Mizaki case as a case of trying to apprehend drug dealers. Whereas Asada is trying to convey to him as more people start to disappear, no, this is a missing persons case. This right. is this is a death case. You need to be looking at it from a question of public safety, you know, in a much broader sense than right. the way you're looking at it now. And he's completely deaf to it. Like, even after he's brought to the hospital where he gets the interview and we get the flashback with the fisherman, even after he is, you know, shown by Asada, here, I'm just going to pelt this frog with radiation. It Look, it melted. And look, the melted byproduct of the frog is still alive. It's still like a living right. liquid. Right, right. And e none of that is able to penetrate Tomonaga. And it, and, it, and it really is interesting because as the crime plot becomes more, more clearly <clears throat> irrelevant to the actual crisis at hand in the narrative, it also becomes more confusing. 
like I feel like you know so the second person to be assimilated by the H by the liquid people is Nishiyama and Nishiyama were introduced to him in the club scene and like a lot of the characters in the movie were not even given their name we're only shown them in their relationship to other characters so he's just this guy who shows up into the in the club Later that night, he breaks into Chicago's apartment and assaults her, basically trying to find out exactly what the police are find, trying to find out. Where is Mizaki? And then as he flees the apartment, he is assimilated by the liquid people. Chicago witnesses it, but doesn't tell anyone because she doesn't believe that anyone will believe her. So now not only are they looking for Mizaki, they're looking for Nishiyama. And there's this one great scene in the film where it's almost Coen Brothers-esque. Like, it's so, it's so much different than anything I've ever seen in a lot of noir movies, is that now the police go to Nishiyama's house, they break in, and they find a body of another gangster on the floor who's been shot in the head. Now, this scene was cut out of the American version, probably partially because the image of the guy with the wound in his head was considered a little too grotesque. Right you know, that they might have problems with the censors, but also because, again, it's another one of these scenes which isn't advancing the plot of the film, but is emphasizing just how seriously broken the whole situation is. Because as far as I can remember, we didn't see the guy who is dead in any other circumstances. And it's unclear whether, like, how long he's been there, because presumably Nishiyama was just killed the very same night we saw him in the club, and then, like, 48 hours later, the police finally go to his house, and they discover a body there, and they have no idea who it is. They, you know, and it's just, like, such an interesting and nuanced way to structure the story. And, like, a lot of this happens in the movie, just these, like, this vagary where you don't really know explicitly who a lot of people are or what their role is, this misdirection where the police are constantly wrong in whatever thread they try to follow in terms of, like, getting to the bottom of the case. I think it's the my highest compliment to the movie is that it is so, in a way, strategically convoluted but the structuring of the narrative itself is so tight. A half hour into the movie, we find out what the liquid people are. We see them for the first time. Another half hour later or so, we have a, another action set piece where the liquid people this time go to the nightclub and start assimilating everybody just as the police are making their um, right. bust of all the criminals in the club. And then we get another climactic special effects sequence at the at roughly twenty minutes later. So it's like it's not it's not a movie that's chock a block with special effects spectacle. A lo most of it is just straightforwardly character driven and situation driven. Right. And I think it's a really uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts on like comparatively like at least compared to movies we've seen so far. Like what is your well, impression of the writing of the no, film. No, it's definitely more complicated. That's absolutely. It's, it's not linear in terms of just a creature. To me, it doesn't seem to fit all too much because mm. you, you have to, you know, you have to have a certain belief system to know that that these police are that linear thinking and they're not taking, just missing some basic details like how the. You or just ignoring the contrary evidence when it's presented right. to them. Right, not only that, but just the fact that these clothes are all interlocked. Why would you want to spend time interlocking? <laughs> You're them? really hung up on yeah. this part. It's not just that he left his clothes yeah. behind. It's that he, he stopped a button and zip up the pants again, you idiots. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. I get my well, that is true like it like it is, it is a thing that you know so perhaps that is one failing of the film maybe that like the police are so <laughs> narrowly fixated that it kind of straight but well, I guess it isn't help. that but isn't that part of the fun of these movies is that like you no. know finally you have a character who just comes in and says I'm telling you it's radioactive liquefied people and then the conventional the people in the conventional positions of authority are just like nah, I don't think that's it Right, even though the the one criminal at the end actually interlocks his clothes to make it look yeah, like that's a, another yeah that's right. a, and that's the thing is that like I think the movie does a little bit of a better job than you felt necessarily about you know tying the elements of this useless criminal plot with the larger like I guess we could call one the symptomatic plot and one the 
uh, infectious plot. The symptomatic plot is the one that is only informed by the infectious part, which is, the, you know, the liquid people do something, and then it sets this entire other narrative in motion, which begins to fall apart as the police realize that, like, they're chasing the wrong... Um, right. The, chasing the wrong dragon, as it were. And then, like, in the climb, in the scene, in the second act, the second special effects sequence, where the the liquid people have come to where Chicago is, per, they've come to where presumably a lot of these criminals did their shady dealings and their backstabbing, so it's like, there's almost like this zombie movie-like suggestion that, like, the liquid people are not conscious of what they're doing, but they're going to, almost like Dawn of the Dead, they're, like, going back to the places that they remember in life and just feeding on what's there and at one point the the driver who we saw get away at the beginning of the film he gets away from the police by just taking off all of his clothes and buttoning it together and throwing them in a heap in the basement <laughs> although like we should we should talk about the other credulity straining part where it's like it's only 24 hours later that asada mentions to uh, tomonaga hey yeah i don't i don't think that guy was melted and tomonaga's like what how do you know and asada's like well he didn't have radioactive slime all over his clothes that was sort of our big tell right right <laughs> uh, so uh let, so let's uh, get down to the uh third act because i think it's sort of you know it's like so we we have the establishment of these parallel crises one is the symptomatic one of criminality and one is the infectious systemic one of nuclear proliferation. The latter is animating the former, and so the nar the dramatic the dramatic tension of the movie becomes, you know, Asada trying to convince Tomonaga to abandon his fixation on the one aspect of his authority that he has in order to address a problem where he might need to give up mm -hmm. a, a certain amount of control. You know, Asada isn't, you know, like he is portrayed as a, uh, a a positive figure in the film, and that's something that uh, that's also unique to I think to a lot of Japanese films, or at least particularly the ones made by Toho, where they're what makes them dis distinct from sort of Western films is that there is not as much a um, portrayal of scientists themselves as being the source of a crisis or being people who make a problem worse like i can think of like from hell it came and from um Kaltiki. right we're already well acquainted with these sort of either incompetent or incompetence or mad crazy scientist people but like this this portrays a kind of much different look at the sciences and you're right that these uh, the scientists tend to be more in the positive light they're the ones that actually are raising other hypotheses to solve the uh the problems within the movie, the, the killers, whatever you're talking about in this particular case. Some of the other films, as we saw, usually it's an aptitude. Oh, it'll take eight hours so we can all disappear and leave the tree creature with the infusion on. Some of the things are really stupid, just like the guy that plugs in the wrong... Well, that's not a scientist. That happens to be a, a uh, military guy who plugs in the wrong... You're, th guy you're talking about the monster that challenged... Wait, what are you talking about? He plugs in the wrong... What? Well, it, it, the thing from another world where the, the guy is supposed to be... Oh, yeah, he guy, plugs in the, the, the electrical blanket and it melts the... Right, he plugs <laughs> in the wrong the... one. He wants to plug in his, but he plugged in the wrong one, apparently. <laughs> so, here's an But, example. yeah, the thing from another world is another t yeah. type A example of the evil... But you're right, you're ...of right. the incompetent or evil right. scientist, because that's one where or the, the scientist... Or the guy bringing home blobs and Tupperware and hoping that... Well, yeah, because, like, <laughs> with, the, with the thing from another world, that's an example where the scientist is, like, literally giving blood to the, uh, the alien life form that makes it grow. And that's where you get a very explicit opposition between the military guy and the scientist guy, because the scientist guy has all of these, like nebulous and you know fantastical ideas about oh we're gonna learn so much from this creature and he's even willing to go all the way to the end of sac sacrificing other people in order for him to attain knowledge whereas the really heroic guy is the military guy who's just like we need to just blow this thing up and you right. know of course what they say at the movie is keep watching the skies that this is not the this is not the end this right. is just the beginning of so the, i mean you're right though the scientists are often in much better light in these japanese films you're absolutely right. They're yeah. the ones. They're, they're the sober, not the sober, at least the sobering uh, people that are 
in the films. And if anything, not, not necessarily sobering either, because like if there's someone who's sober, it's Tomonaga. That's a man who has never taken a drink in his life. You know, is very straight shooting right down the middle. Right, of it. it has right. no time for any no, I meant sort in terms of. of uh... He follows his he follows his instincts, whereas the way Asada is characterized is despite being a scientist, and he admits that his hypothesis is far fetched, but he it's almost implied in this film that far from science being kind of this utilitarian or objectifying influence on the on a person the science is in fact you know that scientific discipline and grounding is actually inspiring his ability to recognize when there is a broader problem that conventional means of authority just aren't right. capable of meeting right and i guess we and i i think that really does it's not just about it being formulaic to a lot of toho films it's that i think this film in particular really makes that a point of a kind of moral messaging because at one point chicago goes to asada and finally admits yes i saw nishiyama melted by the uh, liquid people i know that this is the problem when she realizes how much asada and dr maki and the university uh uh lab already know about the the reality of the liquid people you know she has a moment where she's like well why aren't you going to the press with and with all of your findings and you know asada has this you know he has his own disciplinary you know shortcomings just like tomonaga does where he's like you know well we can't really ethically publish what we know until we can really confirm it in reality right and so you know and her whole thing is that like you know it's like she never explicitly says it's because of my station in life or because you know as a nightclub singer or because i'm a woman but there but she does talk about how you know she says explicitly about how like you know like no one's gonna believe me yeah right. no one's going to believe me like you guys have all of the moral authority and the credibility that people will believe you so the fact is is that Whatever your, you know, personal priorities are or your, you know, what you consider to be a necessary bare minimum threshold before you can, like, release this information to the public, people are dying. And, you know, by association, a lot of it is kind of implicitly that, you know, people like Chicago are dying. People like right. Mizaki are dying. Right. I've given up hope of ever seeing Misaki. He's gone. Tell me something. What is being done to protect other people from this? We could do a lot, but the police won't believe us. Maybe they will, later. Why later? Aren't people disappearing? Oh, it's no use. No one believes me. I saw a living man melt to nothing. Believe me, it's true. You must warn the people. And so what's interesting there is, is that the people who are the victims or primarily the victims of the liquid people in this movie are the ones who are treated by the police unilaterally as the threat itself. Right. Well, the, the one, the one detective does get killed. So yeah. I mean, and, and it turns out to be exactly the one who says, I believe Chicago. Right. You know, that is the arc of the narrative, isn't it? Is that like, you know, it's, it's about realizing the extent to which the police have just fantastically failed as a m form of conventional authority to address the real problem. And that part of the reason they're unable to address it is because they see the victims as the perpetrators. They see the people who are on the outside and the criminal element as the primary vehicles of what's going wrong when actually these people are the disproportionate victims right. of what's That's going right. wrong. That's right. And I think it's it goes back to the quality of the liquid people themselves as characters and why they are not simply monsters. We've already talked about how Dr. Maki, he hypothesizes that, you know, it preserves the people's psyches can be preserved when they're assimilated we've already talked about how like you know beauty and the liquid people wherever chicago goes mizaki in his liquefied form you know also goes but there's another thing about the liquid people that distinguishes them from the other blob monsters we've seen which is that while they do primarily just go around in this ooze form mm -hmm. 
they also occasionally take on a humanoid form, and it's basically just a man in a suit that is du- who is double exposed over an image of whatever the scenery is, but it's a, just a man in a green, slimy suit. And it, and it becomes this question of, like, you know, why, far from the trend of human beings being melted down, we now have this complementary image of this ooze reforming itself and reshaping itself for reasons that don't really seem to have any, like, logical explanation. They seem to be, you know, they seem to be pretty arbitrary in terms of when they occur in the narrative. That's true. They are arbitrary. You're absolutely right. I think it's just it is, it's the, the realization of the metaphor that they, they retain some human psyche. So, in a way, that illustrates how they become somewhat human, you know, even though they're still liquid people, they try to. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not clear why they do it. I mean, and really I, do, do that and walk yeah. out of the damn drain, you know. What, I mean. Yeah, because they're still part of the same mass. And that's another thing. Like, like how many psyches are in this, you know, in this mass? Oh. And how many people can it create? And it just. Well, as many, as many thugs as there are roaming the streets that operate under one gang. Yeah. The H-Man can exist as individuals that are still have one. Yeah. Kind of univer- unified uh, format, right? Yeah, it, it really is just a repetition. It's right. Like, so it's like, it, and that also gets back to the sort of unified identity of them. Where, And again, it goes back to the rooting of the film's spectacle in the real reference to the Lucky Dragon number five insti- incident, where it's like, presumably the first H people were these fishermen who then go out and assimilate other fishermen and then start to assimilate other people who are on the margins of Japanese society. But then, so what that association means is that at the root of this film, the monsters are also the victims. The monsters created by the hydrogen bomb are also just straightforwardly people who mm-hmm. have been the victims of radioactive right. fallout. That's right. And it's and I think it does come to a head in the climax of the movie because basically the plan once they finally, you know, once it becomes in unignorable that the eight, the liquid people do exist, basically the plan is just to light the sewers and the river on fire and basically try to incinerate all of the uh, liquid people that are still existing there. And it occurred to me, there's two things about the climax. One is that during the scene in which the sewer is being set on fire and there's a like a subplot about like a subplot about Chicago being kidnapped by the driver so that he can use her as a hostage while he goes to collect some drugs that are in the sewer but and so she gets rescued but as they're burning the h men as they're lighting the sewer on fire there is this one part where the characters look back and they see that the h men have taken on their humanoid forms as they are being burned alive And then we come back to the surface, we see, you know, the entire harbor is just being lit up in flames. It's an incredible, like, again, just like the opening, it's an incredibly eerie and unnerving sight because there's nothing proud about it. There's nothing really successful or deterministic about it. But then, once again, what do we hear? we hear the patriotic marching music. And so we once again, you know, d- you know, bookending the film rather nicely, we have this, you know, the, this ironic contradiction between sound and image, between what is supposed to be the underlying emotion of the scene and what, we're, what is actually registering to us as viewers. Yeah, I, don't know, I, don't, I can't explain that at all. I just can't figure that out. You're right. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this, but it, it gets back to um, the Americanization of these films. For those who don't know, Godzilla, when it was um, distributed in America in 1956, it was it had new scenes shot of the actor Raymond Burr and other new cast members, and he was edited into the film in order to make him the primary um, narrator and protagonist of the film. And so one really telling difference between the cuts of the film is that while at the end of the original Godzilla, it's Dr. Yamane who delivers this closing 
portentous monologue about how one Godzilla has been destroyed, but there could be more if the thing that causes Godzilla isn't addressed. Versus what happens at the end of Godzilla King of the Monsters, the Americanized version, is once Godzilla is killed, we hear Raymond Burr, the white American narrator, saying, The menace was gone. So was a great man. But the whole world could wake up and live again. No reference to the idea that another Godzilla could be just on the horizon. No addressing of what that. No, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense either. Because the the, the before we see Godzilla, they find a live trilobite, <laughs> which means yeah, there's, but... there's probably tons of prehistoric things that are being resurrected that they haven't found yet. I mean, so it doesn't make any sense. At all. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, right? I they can't finally... believe I forgot that. Yeah, they find a prehistoric animal perfectly reser- preserved in Godzilla's footprint. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah you're right. It's a trilobite. Isn't it supposed to be extinct? You know, or something yeah, like exactly. that. Or whatever. But yeah. anyway, so the H-Men, again, being a kind of spiritual remake of Godzilla, uh, it does include a very similar uh, closing monologue from Dr. Maki instead of Dr. Yamane, where he says, the H-Man that appeared here in Tokyo is as good as dead, but we cannot guarantee there will be, never be another H-Man again. And then he follows that up with an address to the audience where he says, if this Earth were covered in radioactive fallout and humanity faced extinction, the next species to rule the world could very well be the H-Man. Right. And I think what's interesting is that as opposed to Godzilla King of the Monsters, the Columbia Pictures dub of the film did not dilute or right. change the ending message of the film. That's right. Which I think, you know, despite what, what I already mentioned in the disclaimer about the uh, horribly uh, racist dubbing, and just some of the dubbing is actually quite hurtful to the film. Like, there are lots of parts in the movie where there's actually no dialogue but where there's dubbing anyway, presumably because they just didn't think American kids were gonna... They thought American kids would, like, lose attention. But but as far as that goes, I think it is interesting that the American distributors of the film didn't see the need to manufacture a new message to the ending of the film and just sort of let it be this sort of... So it's interesting that the Columbia Pictures edit did include that stuff... St- did keep that stuff and i'm wondering if that might even be a reflection about the you know the periodic threat of nuclear proliferation just became increasingly unignorable because the guy who directed the beast from Twenty Thousand fathoms which as you mentioned it ends with them using a radioactive weapon to defeat a monster created by a radioactive weapon but the man who directed that movie eugene lore he would go on to direct another film, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which also, it's very much like Godzilla. It's very much, uh, it's much less optimistic. And you really do see, and then he followed that up with Gorgo in the 60s. So you, you even with American directors, I think I could argue, or Western directors, I think I could argue that the, the sort of contradictions of American ideology were just becoming too great to reconcile. That it's clear if nuclear proliferation is going to create this unique problem, that it's not enough for the conventional apparatuses of authority, particularly the military, to just say, no we have a we have an eventuality we have it covered that like you know like i think it's maybe that's what the sort of columbia pictures dub not changing the ending kind of portends that like you know it's kind of getting into the water that this is a you know that mutually assured destruction is a really hopeless situation if man perishes from the face of the earth due to the effects of hydrogen bombing it is possible that the next ruler of our planet may be the H-Man. The H-Man is a movie, I think we could, you know, if we had to boil it down, I think it is very nuanced, but if we had to boil it down, we would say, I would say that the way it expands upon Godzilla is that it's not just about nuclear proliferation creating a situation where there's a tremendous loss loss of human life but it changes it to another situation where there is that threat of the human cost of human casualties but it's also a much larger question about 
what living in a atom age, so to speak, does to people at an existential level. Because I, I think the image that Dr. Maki conjures about the H-Man becoming the new species to dominate the Earth it goes back to what you mentioned about the liquid people as being just this a evocation of de devolved people about like you know it's merely by this thing existing like something it's not just it created a monster it's something in humanity has been very deeply and troublingly altered no you're right that's absolutely right that's that's the kind of um image you get when you see the whole thing in totality with the with the liquid people and the effects that they, you know, and the way the, the authors have tried to portray the film. So, uh, ranking the uh, Blob movies that you've seen, because we've already seen, uh, we haven't done them all for the show, but we've seen Kaltiki, we've seen Quatermass Experiment, we've seen The Blob, now we've seen The H-Man. Where would you put H-Man in your ranking probably of Blob the, movies? Probably the, the second. Uh, probably yeah? Probably. What's the first? First would be Quatermass. So All right, far. good. Then it's good that we're going to cover that uh, next week. So, guys, stay tuned, and it's going to be a double feature. We're not going to tell you what the double feature is, but it will be one of them will be the Quatermass experiment. Uh, what have we learned today, Rocco? Well, that's a good question. I guess crime does not pay. Mm -hmm. Of course, the only true monster is man. Right, fair enough. If the cops are after you, just strip and go from there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for joining us on Monster Craze Memoirs. See you next week.